dramatic structure. So in thinking about the play, and particularly how a playwright sets up the structure of the play, we might want to think about the playwright as someone who creates the blueprint, similar to how an architect might create the blueprint for how a building gets built. So the playwright has a vision of the play and creates this blueprint. And of course, the director and actors and designers then manifest it. But this blueprint really does shape what that, that play is going to look like. And the playwright does this by determining the order of events. So a play might open in the past and then move to the present or vice versa, might move, start in the present and then move to the past. So this sort of order of events is part of what gets laid out in this structure. And the playwright uses what our author calls a grammar of theater. So thinking about a play as a grammatical structure or a grammatical sentence that you would have a subject and a verb and objects. So the subject are the characters and they actually do things, right? That's the drama of, of the, the play. So the doing and the verb, the active verb is the performing, the doing something. It's, it's no um, mystery that the word drama actually comes from the Greek word dran, D-R-A-N, which means to do. And so actually most, most actors will study their parts and think about action verbs. What are they doing in the play? And, and a good playwright will actually provide action that moves the play forward from beginning to middle to end. And obviously there are exceptions to these rules in terms of say postmodern theater or even um, episodic structure, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But the conventions of drama typically are um, a sort of rules of the play or performance. And these conventions usually include that the play takes place in a sort of limited space. It's not gonna jump all over the world or all over um, to different locations, um, partially because it's more difficult to stage when a play um, has multiple locations like that. So a playwright usually limits the space. They might even limit the time period. So maybe uh, the play takes place over a short period of time. Usually the playwright provides characters that represent sort of um, strong opposing forces. So if you think about this idea of the protagonist and antagonist, and that these forces have a sort of balance that is constantly shifting back and forth. So they, they need to be somewhat um, formidable in the sense that they will uh, challenge each other. If you have a protagonist that's much stronger than the antagonist, then that's not a very interesting story or vice versa. So there's a balance of these forces. There's also usually some sort of incentive to, and motivation to what it is that they are doing. This gets back to this idea of what a character wants more than anything else in the world. So if you have one character wanting some one thing and then the opposing force, their wants somehow come in conflict, then you have really interesting drama because in order for those two things to exist, someone has to lose or win. So those, those are sort of the ideas behind incentive and motivations. Typically, directors will read a play and figure out aspects of motivation in terms of blocking. So they're looking at this larger picture, whereas an actor is looking more internally at their own character in terms of their own incentive of why they are doing something, what their motivation is. So motivation and incentive can operate on multiple levels within a play. Now, a couple of things to discern in terms of dramatic structure is the difference between, say, plot and story. So story is the narrative. So that is what the play is about. What do the people do in this play versus plot? Plot is like the arrangement of the actual scenes that are based on the story, but it's that arrangement that then creates a certain um, pattern of, of structure. 
And then um, the other element that is typically really important to the dramatic structure is creating dramatic characters. So if a playwright has sort of set all of these things in motion, they usually have a very tight script. If it's limited space, limited time, opposing forces that um, are, are somewhat equal in, in their struggle and that the characters have clear incentives and motivations that are also possibly in conflict with each other and that that the plot is interesting. Obviously the story is interesting, but also this arrangement of how these elements take place. In dramatic structure, in a play, the opening scene really sets the tone and style for everything that follows. So far, in terms of the plays that we've looked at, Machinal, that opening scene really sets this idea of, of an expressionistic style that that everybody's operating like machines and they have their little jobs and roles and they're being shaped by whatever that job is that they're doing. So that opening scene really sets that tone. The play that we were going to look at this week, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf by Edward Albee, that opening scene sets a lot of the tone and style for the rest of the play. It's sort of a roller coaster of, of wild barrage of, of, of very... Uh, snippy, sassy, and zippy dialogue between the two characters, Martha and George, and we're constantly, um, we're trying to figure out in that opening scene, are they teasing each other? Are they critiquing each other? What's going on in this relationship? And so that opening scene really sets the tone for the rest of the play. In terms of obstacles, so I talked a little bit about incentives and motivations. Well, typically a playwright will set obstacles that are, are complications or impediments that get in the way of the character. We can think of an obstacle in a very overt way, like a physical thing that gets in your way. But obstacles can also be emotional, they can be psychological, they can be um, more nefarious, they can culminate, they can build on each other, or perhaps a character gets past one obstacle only to find that there's another obstacle. So there's all sorts of ways that a playwright can create obstacles for characters in a play. So thinking about what obstacles does Helen in Machinal, sometimes um, the play is pronounced Machinal, I've heard it both ways, but what sort of obstacles does she have in her way in terms of her path or what she wants more than anything else in, in the world? That's her super objective. So what obstacles get in her way in order to achieve that super objective? In Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, we're looking at what obstacles are in, there's four characters, right? So there's Martha, George, Nick, and Honey. And each of those characters have obstacles that get in their way. Typically, we put place drama into two types of structure. Crisis, crisis or climactic structure, and then episodic structure. So Machinal was clearly episodic structure. The play itself, each scene was actually called episode. And what we find in episodic structure is that there's not an adherence to things like time and place or even um, a tight plot. But in crisis or climactic structure, there's a series of crises that sort of build to the final crisis, which is the climax. And then there's some sort of um, resolution, and it can be happy or sad at the end. And this sort of structure we, we've learned as a Aristotelian um, form of drama that goes back to the Greeks, and, and certainly we, we teach this and learn this in terms of just good storytelling, but it's not the only structure. Like I said before, episodic structure is also as valid in theater. And sometimes plays use a combination. But for this week, we're going to really concentrate on, on the crisis and climactic structure because Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf very clearly follows the structure. So it'll be interesting to sort of look at that. And then the other thing about plays, what the playwright puts into play is the point of view. So is this play tragic or is it comic or is it some sort of mixture of both? So the dramatist really sets that tone and 
sometimes sometimes the playwright is also interested in society's point of view society's point of view about a specific topic certainly with a doll's house ibsen had a certain uh, point of view or critique of society's point of view about women and then lee brewer as the director and mabu minds as the company took on that play and placed it in a different context for a contemporary audience so society's point of view might be under underneath everything because of the time period that a play is written or the style that it's written or maybe the playwright's actually commenting on that particular topic in terms of genres there's no sort of cookie cutter type of genre that every playwright follows there's all sorts of genres in um, on Wednesday I'll be discussing more of that so um, I want to talk just briefly about that episodic structure so we saw with machinal this idea of episodic structure that that the play might be organized by people it might be organized by places or actual events and in machinal we have sort of all three of those circulating that we have different events happening within each episode obviously every episode revolves around the one character but we travel through different locations and within episodic structure we might even have multiple plots we might have subplots or we might have scenes that contrast each other because they are skipping time or even um, skipping like we might see it from the point of view of one character and then another scene from another character. So episodic structure really breaks the conformity of what we've learned in terms of Western drama of, of the climactic structure. But for this week, we're going to concentrate on climactic structure for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. So that's basically some of the ideas behind dramatic structure, as well as how the playwright lays out these different ideas in terms of of motivations, incentives for characters, as well as um, building upon uh, little climaxes to a final climax and then some sort of resolution. All right, talk to you later. <laughs>